Sometimes I go for a drive, just to spend some time with God, get away. I like to drive all around, thinking and praying over our communities. How many people, families, need to be introduced to Jesus? What would God have us do? Sometimes that thought overwhelms me. Sometimes I end up in some of the rougher areas of town. You know, the areas where people have moved away due to crime, poverty, drugs, and other things. The people who do live there uh, often have nowhere to go, and the stores and businesses are closing or being boarded up. It's a real sense of helplessness. You can see it in the people as they go by. And it's easy to think, hey, we just need more programs. Uh, we just need to send more people down there to help. But I don't think that's the answer either. What these neighborhoods need is a vibrant, healthy church right there where they live, pouring into the community and making a difference where they are. Where are these churches? And we have to ask ourselves, does the good news of Jesus have anything to say to these forgotten areas? Are we called to make a difference here? I think so. I have no idea how to do this. And, and, and then there's this stretch of road near where I live. In one of the fastest growing areas of town, it's, it's, a, it's a busy road. I travel it all the time. And from the highway where you, you get off on the exit, and for the next five to six miles, there's, there's not a single church, not one, on this road. And yet they're digging dirt and putting new housing projects up all around there. And I get it, these people, maybe they don't have the same problems as the difficult areas do. But did you know something? Money doesn't solve all your problems either. Sometimes it just makes them worse. And the reality sets in, these people need Jesus so much, too. And then as I often do, I drive through some of the smaller rural communities all over the map of Iowa where there are these amazing people in great small towns, proud people who love the community they live in. And, and, and there's a church there, one or two. It's 50, 75, sometimes even older, and they're, they're great churches, but they haven't changed in decades. And they won't. They can't. There's been no baptisms, no salvations. There's no life. And I ask myself, are, are we okay with that? Because I'm not. How do we bring a fresh wind of the gospel to a group of people that desperately need to hear it? Who's going to go there? And then I wonder, is God calling Radiant to make a difference there too? Because this I know, we're, we're called to multiply. And I think God is calling us to make a difference in all the areas around us. But for now... I keep driving and praying. How about you? great to be back. Sorry to miss last week, but I had the opportunity to go help another pastor uh, get some rest and relaxation, which I have totally heard of, and, and someday look forward to doing the same myself. So, But no, it's great to just allow them to go spend some time with God, with family, and do the things they need to do. Thanks for letting me go, but it sounds like we had a great week. I, I got to spend some time with Fritz before I left, and uh, last week you got to hear his testimony. You got to hear a little bit about his passion and his vision for Haiti. It was awesome. I 
got to watch it on video. It was just wonderful to hear his heart, not only for the orphans, but how he has a vision to raise up a generation that wants to bring real change to Haiti. I can get behind that in a really big way. And so I'm excited as we begin building a relationship with him. But what excites me even more is we raised $3,100 last week to send to him. How awesome is that? Man. I'm just praising God for that and so grateful for your generosity and for all you've done. We've got so many more things that we're going to be doing as we further commit to this relationship with Haiti and the orphans and Fritz. And uh, we're going to talk about some of them in the coming weeks. Pastor Ben spoke about a few last week, but I just kind of want to reinforce them to get them on our radar screen a little bit. Uh, For instance, in in just a few weeks, we're going to be talking Christmas boxes. Can you believe we're talking Christmas? That's awful. Uh, But but time's here. It's October now. And uh, in the past, we've uh, partnered with Operation Christmas Child. This year, we're not going to partner with Operation Christmas Christmas child. What we've decided to do this year is we're going to partner with Fritz and the orphans in Hades, and we're going to be sending Christmas boxes directly to them. And so I'm very excited about that. And uh, Fritz is working on getting us a list right now of what the orphans need, what might be valuable for them, and, and we'll get that list out. And then we're looking forward to just being able to write letters. We have pictures of the orphans and names. And it's just going to be cool to know who we're sending this box to. But we're going to need to get those boxes out by mid uh, to early November if they're going to get to Haiti on time and uh, be a blessing for them then. So we are looking forward to that. We're also looking forward to reserving our Christmas Eve offering this year for the Haitian orphans as well, too. So that's going to be awesome. And we're trying and working on possibly a way to live simulcast them in singing Silent Night at Christmas Eve as well, too. So, so yeah, yeah, don't get excited yet. Uh, <laughs> there's some technology stuff in there we're going to have to play with a little bit, but man, we're praying and I think it's going to be great. We're also working uh, with the young adults and beginning a conversation to send a first missions trip over there sometime early in the year to further develop that relationship. But God is so good. We're already working on a second trip. And one of the things as I talked to Fritz is he said, you know what? We need at least eight more solar panels for us to be fully independent and have reliable electricity. And I thought we can do that. I mean, that's totally something we can do. Not only purchase those solar panels, panels, but I believe we've got just the right people here who can go and install those panels as well. And so I'm excited if you can't tell uh, a little bit. But I just love seeing God at work, and I'm looking to further talking through that relationship, further talking through our Sierra Leone connection that we also have, and we'll get some more information on that in the coming weeks. God is at work, and it's just wonderful to see as we get and are allowed by his grace to make a difference in the world around us. Amen to that. We're going to wrap up our series today, uh, Go Live, Love, and multiply. And so I'm looking forward to talking about particularly that idea of multiply this week. But before we get to multiply, I kind of want to just review some things, if I could, in the series so we can catch up. Maybe you've missed a week, and I encourage you to go to our website at radiantonline.org and catch up. And uh, we've got a YouTube page as well, and uh, we're on iTunes. So any of those areas, you can go and get caught up to the series. But in week one, we talked about go. This idea written throughout the entire Bible that we are the sent people of God. That Christianity was never ever meant to be a spectator sport. That we're not meant to occupy a chair. That God is calling each of us to go to the various realms of influence we have in our lives and bring the good news of Jesus wherever God sends us. And the, and the Bible's full of stories of God sending people. He, if you're familiar with the story of Abraham, he sent Abraham out to a foreign land and to create the new promise that God is working through a group of people to bring freedom as we talked about already. We we focused in on Moses and how Moses was sent by God to go to the pharaohs or those people in the world who would oppress and say, in the name of Jesus, let my people go. But there's many people that he sent. He sent Jonah to Nineveh, even when Jonah didn't want to go, if you're familiar with that story. There's just many of stories, but even Jesus, in one of his final dialogues with his disciples, left those instructions for us to go. And I want to look at that verse again today. It's in Matthew 28, and talk more about this idea of go real quick. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations 
Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And the great reminders we talked about that week. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we are to go with that message of the good news. In week two, we talked about live. What does it mean to live as Jesus lived? And when we talk about living as Jesus lived, we're talking about a fancy word in the New Testament that is discipleship. And we asked ourselves an important question. If we are called to be disciples of Jesus, if we are to be followers of Jesus, what is a disciple? Do we have a good, strong, working definition and understanding of what that word meant? Not just today, but what did it mean? What did it mean to the original audience he was talking to? What would they have understood this word disciple to mean? Because that understanding is what we bring into our lives today. What Jesus meant by disciple is how we should live today. And the definition we came to on that is that a disciple is a person who leaves their old life behind to be with a master in order to learn to do the things their master does say the things their master says with the intent of becoming who or what their master is. This is so important for our understanding of what it means to be a disciple, that when Jesus is calling us to be a disciple or when we claim to be a disciple, what we are saying is this. We are the people who do the things Jesus does. We are the people who say the things Jesus says, and we are becoming like Jesus more and more in all that we do. That's the key to our understanding of a disciple, that they are doing, that they are saying, but most importantly, becoming. And we have to ask the question in our lives, are you becoming more like Jesus Christ in all that you do? Because we're called to be disciples, we're called to be followers. Last week, we talked about love. What does it mean to love as Jesus loved, whereas live is inward, it's, it's, it's reflection on ourselves. Love is an outward expression. How do we express how we live like Jesus to the world around us? We love as Jesus loved. And so that was part of the reason we brought Fritz in that weekend is that is an outward expression on our part of how we can love the world around us one of many different ways. Pastor Ben talked about the story of the Good Samaritan. He did an incredible job, but he asked an important question there we constantly have to ask. And that question is this, who's your neighbor, right? Who is your neighbor? And we're going to talk about that just a tad here in a little bit as well too, because it ties in with where we're headed today as well. Today we get to this word, multiply. What does it mean to multiply? What does it mean to go and make more disciples? Because what happened in the early church is they took Jesus' word seriously and the disciples went out and they made more disciples and those new disciples made more disciples and it was disciples making disciples making disciples. But what happened is as they did that, the church began to grow and as the church began to grow, there was a need for leaders because they needed people to help guide things, prepare things, do the things that leaders do. And so they began to raise up a group of leaders and as they began to raise up a group of leaders, those leaders would go out throughout the Roman Empire empire and beyond, and those leaders would end up planting churches. And guess what those churches would end up doing? Those churches would end up making disciples, and then they would end up making leaders, and then they would make more churches. And that's how the early church grew. And that has not changed today. If you ask how the church is supposed to grow, and I'm talking about the big church, but Radiant too. It is disciples making disciples making disciples who develop leaders, who develop more leaders, who then make churches and more churches who end up doing it all over again. It is multiplying disciples, leaders, and churches in that order. Now, right before Jesus was to go back into heaven, he left some final instructions to his disciples. We saw this verse in the video, but I want us to look at it again. That verse is in Acts Uh, chapter 1, verse 8. His final instructions were this. He says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
And from what we know of the story after Jesus went back into heaven is this is precisely what happened. His disciples went back to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they awaited, and and on a day that we call Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down, and, and they went out and spoke with courage and with tongues of fire, it said. And on that day, thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ and make a decision to be followers of Jesus Christ, thousands of them. And the early church was birthed right there in Jerusalem. And they stayed in Jerusalem for a while. The church continued to grow. They continued to make more disciples and leaders. And that pretty much encompassed about the first seven chapters of Acts. But by about the eighth to the eleventh chapter of Acts, we begin to notice things changing. The church now comes under attack, both from the Roman authorities, but also from the religious authorities of their days. They were being persecuted, even killed for their faith. And what happened is this sent the church and the people in Jerusalem running for their lives out into the neighboring territories and into the hills of Judea and Samaria. And so what Jesus said was going to happen precisely happened as they went out and they began to go out into these neighboring territories. And guess what they did when they went out to these neighboring territories? They made more disciples and they made more leaders and they made more churches and they began planting churches along the way. It's about this time that a man named Paul suddenly appears on the scene and Paul went out and he planted an unknown number of churches and those churches would then go out and they planted churches too. There's letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament to churches he didn't even plant. Why? Because the church in particular in Ephesus he had planted was part of a church planting movement in all the surrounding communities around them. That's how the early church grew, is that they multiplied. And ultimately, that multiplication, just as Jesus said, has made its way throughout much of the world that we know. While there's some areas that the church has not been able to get into yet, it has expanded its influence all over the globe. And so we see Jesus telling them that this is literally going to happen, that you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's happened. But there's a little more going into this verse as well. As we often talk about, there's even some deeper meaning in this verse. Because we might ask the question, well, what does that mean for us today? What does this verse mean for me? The reality is, is we're not in Jerusalem, are we? We don't live in Jerusalem. So how do we apply this verse today? We need to understand there's a little more what Jesus was saying here. When Jesus says that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, what he is saying to them is this, you are to make a difference and and be my representation locally in that area in which you live. You have that sphere of influence in the city that you live in, and I am calling you to make a difference in that city that you live in, to bring the good news that Jesus Christ and his salvation is for everyone, that you can be forgiven of your sins, you can be reconnected to God. We're to make a difference in our city. But outside of Jerusalem are the areas of Judea and Samaria. And what Jesus is saying to them is also you're called to make a difference regionally as well too. I'm not just calling you only to make a difference in the city that you're in. I'm calling you to those neighboring areas, that region in which you live in. And for us, we say, hey, yeah, we're in Pleasant Hill, but probably more likely it's clearer to say we are part of the greater Des Moines area when we refer to our city. But then Jesus would be saying, hey, while I am calling you to make a difference in all the areas of Des Moines, to shine your light, to bring the good news, I am also calling you to make a difference regionally. And when we look at regionally, we can think in terms of the state of Iowa, But we're also part of an even bigger region called the Midwest as well. He's saying, I'm calling you to make a difference regionally as well, too. You can't just stay in Jerusalem, is what he's saying. And so we need to understand that, that it's locally, it's regionally. And then when he talks in terms of the ends of the earth, he is, of course, referring to globally as well, too. That's the deeper meaning of what Jesus was telling them here. 
While literally, yes, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, he's also saying, listen, for everybody, yes, you're called to make a difference in the city that you're in for Jesus Christ, but I'm also calling you to the neighboring communities and to the, to the region that you're in, and ultimately, you're to be a part of bringing this good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. I'm calling you to make a difference throughout the world. It's huge what he's calling us to. But it doesn't end there either. There's an even deeper meaning to what he says in this. You see, when he spoke regionally, he said Judea and Samaria. Now, it's real easy to read over that and just say, hey, that sounds good and move on. But words matter in the Bible. Jesus could have said Judea and we would have gotten the point. Okay, I'm supposed to go regionally. He could have said Samaria and I would have gotten the point. Okay, we're supposed to go regionally. But he said Judea and Samaria, there must be a reason. And there was. His audience of that day would have understood it the very moment they heard it. But we don't live in the first century, so we have to think about it a little bit. But we've been talking about it the last few weeks. Last week, Pastor Ben talked about the Good Samaritan. And Jesus liked to use Samaritans in his story for a reason. It had a tension associated with it. A few weeks ago, we, we talked about the woman at the well in John chapter 4 and come to find out she was a Samaritan woman. Jesus was talking to her, which is very unusual for a man to be talking to a woman, but much less a Jew talking to a Samaritan, much less a rabbi talking to a single woman. It was a very unusual conversation that Jesus was having with this woman at the well. But what, was, what we needed to know most about that story that's important, whether it's the good Samaritan or whether it's the woman at the well, we have to understand that the Jews hated Samaritans. Not disliked. They despised them. They couldn't stand them. Why? Because they were half breeds. They were Israelites that had intermarried with other empires and other countries like Persia and Babylon. And in the process of doing that, had allowed those religions to affect their religion and their spiritual practices. And so the Jews of their day, who who did not intermarry and did not allow other religious practices in, looked at this group of people, looked down at them, and said that you are not good enough, that you are a half-breed. And what's going on here, if you haven't figured it out already, this is racism. It was racism, pure and simple. Jesus brought up Samaria for a reason. First reason was to deal with this idea of racism. That they were looking at him, they had a tendency to look at Samaria and say, these people aren't like us. We don't like them. They are inferior to us. We must avoid them. In fact, they're just not worth our time. And what Jesus was saying to them very clearly was this. You don't get to pick and choose where you take the good news to. I am calling you to take the good news everywhere. You get to take it to the people you like, and you get to take it to the people you don't like. And later he'd basically say, and your dislike is a bad attitude, knock it off. You don't get to choose where the gospel goes. What Jesus says is this gospel, this good news is for everyone. No matter what your race is, No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, no matter what your sexual preference is, no matter what, the good news is for everyone. Jesus brought Samaria up for a reason because what he was saying is you don't get to choose who you tell this message to. This message has to go to the places you want to go and it has to go to the places you don't want to go. I found that enormously convicting. More and more as God reveals this big God-sized dream that I think he's calling us to make a difference, not only in those areas of Des Moines that are difficult socioeconomically, racially, whatever, crime, drugs, all those things that get get into the community and become a cycle of poverty that's very difficult for people to break out of and get out of. God's calling us to those areas. And there's times where I'm like, but Lord, it'd sure be easier to do something over here. A lot easier. 
And guess what he's saying? You don't get to choose, Jason. You will go where I send you. This good news has something to say to everybody, even the people you may not like. That's why he brought up Samaria. And they would have understood it when they heard it. He's saying, listen, you're going to make a difference in Jerusalem. You're going to make a difference in the regional area around you. And you're going to make a difference throughout the world. And, and I get it. There's always a tension. The church is a group of people. are like, wait a minute. I mean, why? why? Why can't we just be that light on the hill here in Pleasant Hill that loves on the community, makes a difference in the community, that, 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 you know, and, and we do have a dream. Listen, we want to be a church that if it were to shut its doors tomorrow would be deeply missed by the community. We want to be that church. And so there's a tendency even to, to say, well, can't we just do this thing here? Just be the best church that we can be right here. But we see Jesus saying, no, you don't get to do that. You don't get to just stay here. I'm calling you to make a difference right where you are in the city you live in, but I'm calling you out to the regional areas and I'm calling you to the ends of the earth. You don't get to. You don't get to just sit around talking about what kind of worship you like, the color of the carpet, and, and whatever other religious discussions we could have. That while people need to know Jesus. You don't get to do that. Jesus' instructions were to go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. And where did he tell them to go? Yes, go to your city, but go to the neighboring areas as well. In fact, go to the end of the earth. Go, live as Jesus lived, love as Jesus loved, and multiply disciples leaders and churches along the way. That's the call. So we need to ask this question, if we could, several questions. Why is multiplication so important then? These are your fill-ins on the back of your worship guide, and I'd love for you to fill these in and look at these again later. They're so important. We're just going to throw some data and facts at you that I think we need to know. Because we're asking that question, why is multiplication so important? I get it, Jason. Jesus said so. But even more so, why is multiplying so important? And I think the first one is, is for me, common sense, probably pretty simple. But I think it needs to be at the top of any list we would make about multiplication. And that's this. Everyone needs to know Jesus. Everyone needs to know Jesus. I want to just say this outright, if I could. And I realize you may not agree with this. Different people come at this discussion. In fact, 50-something percent of the church doesn't believe with this statement. But as your pastor and coach, I'm just going to say it. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Okay? Jesus spoke about heaven and hell many times in the Bible. In fact, he spoke in terms of having seen it that he knew what it was. He wasn't guessing. Jesus made it very clear there is a very real heaven, there's a very real hell, and that he is the way, and he is the truth, and that he is the life. And maybe that sounds exclusive, but okay. Right now, it's for you to deal with the decision, do I believe in Jesus Christ that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Do I need forgiveness of my sins? Do I need to know Jesus Christ? Because I will tell you this, as long as there is one person in our community that doesn't know Jesus, our job is not done. We will continue to fight. We will continue to get the message out. And we'll continue to let people know that there is hope and healing and rescue through Jesus Christ. That's why multiplication is so important. People's final destiny demands our attention. The second reason is this. Less than 18% of Americans attend church. That may surprise you. Less than 18% of Americans attend church. Now, here's some background on that in case you're thinking maybe it's always been that way. No. In uh, 1820, go to the next slide if you could on that. In 1820, there was one church for every 875 Americans. By the turn of the century, there was one church for every 430 Americans. 53% of Americans attended church in 1916. Did you catch that? More than half 
of the population attended church in 1916. 100 years later, we're below 18%. What in the world happened? Another reason it's so important is this. There has been a 19.4% decline in church attendance in just the past decade. Think there's an emergency? Almost 20% decline just in the last 10 years. And the figures we see on that is that only 28% of people ages 23 to 37 attend church as opposed to 43 to 50% of the other generation. So some of the older generations, there was much more attendance, but we're seeing in the younger generation, they're not going to church. They see no meaning, no value, no purpose to it. What do we have to say about that? The next thing is this, 290 million people in the U.S., 65% or 188 million of them have no vital church connection at all. This isn't just Christian, this is like any religious church connection at all. 65% of Americans now have zero connection whatsoever with any religious organization, much less Christianity in the world around them. What does that mean? Because a lot of times people will just say, well, you know, we've got enough churches. Come on, there's one on every corner, it seems like. You know, we don't need more churches. But what we got to realize is this. If we were to start new churches of 1,000 people each, we would need almost 200,000 new churches in the United States to reach all of those people. The next one's up there. The U.S. has the fourth largest population of unreached people in the world. That's the one that surprises folks because we tend to think of ourselves as a Christian nation. And let me dispel that for you. We're not. Not sure we ever were. We're not a Christian nation. The worst part is this. After India, China, and Malaysia, whereas America used to be the largest missionary sending country, we are now the second largest receiving country. Whereas we used to lead the way in sending missionaries out throughout the world to be a light into the darkness, those countries have now looked back at us and said, "Uh uh-oh we better start sending to them. We have now become the second largest receiving missionary country in the world, which means other areas of the world see a bigger emergency than we do. You get that? It's a little bit like frog in boiling water. You know what I mean? If you keep heating the water up, the frog dies because it doesn't know the water is getting up to a boiling point. I wonder if sometimes even as a church, that's what's happened to us. We've just been in it so long, doing what we do, living how we live for so long that like a frog in water whose temperature keeps rising, we have not noticed that the water is now boiling. At what point do we raise up the flag and declare an emergency? At what point do we say something is wrong? Where is the urgency in it? The last one's sad. 85% of all churches in America are either plateaued or declining. 85% of all churches. Of the 15% growing, 14% are transfers from other countries, or not countries, churches. That means that only one out of 100 churches are actually introducing people to Jesus. sharing their faith, witnessing. Fancy word is evangelizing. When's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When do we declare an emergency? And which one of those is us? Let's bring this a little bit closer to home. In Polk County, 
there are more than 236,000 people that are not affiliated with any religious context at all, much less Christianity. Not just Christianity, but you can see it. There's 236 people they call unclaimed. They do not claim any religious connection or affiliation. We call that unchurched behind the scenes here. May not even be the CEO type. What's a CEO? Christmas, Easter, occasional. <laughs> They're out there. I'll never forget getting my hair cut uh, when I was in the Quad Cities at a church, and, and uh, I was part of a church there called, called Heritage. And, and um, you know, I told her I was a pastor, and she's like, oh, yeah, I go to church. Where do you go? I go to Heritage. It's my home church. Oh, which one? I go to the one in the Bettendorf campus? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> but she went on Easter, she went on Christmas, it was her church. Was it really impactful in her life? I don't know. But that's a huge number. Within a five square mile radius of our campus here, there are more than 97,000 people and if all the facts and figures I've showed you are true, it gives you an idea of a five-mile radius there. It takes you up into Bondurant, a little bit almost to Ankeny, Mitchellville. If it's true, then more than 79,000 people in our county in this five-mile radius area have no vital church connection or relationship with Jesus Christ at all. Just around us, there's more than 79,000 people that have no connection to church or God or Christianity at all. Is that number bigger than you thought it might be? It's a big number. That's just our community. So it gets us to our so what moment. I want to ask a question. I'm not being crass. I'm coming at you as your coach. I tell you that all the time. I'm your coach, not your judge, okay? Does any of this bother you? It's a fair question. Because you can sit there and go, no, not really. But I need to ask you, does any of this bother you? I want you to think on that in the coming week because it's hard right here to process all that. That was a lot of facts. There was a lot of data coming at you. So I wanted you to write it down. I'd love for you to look over that, pray over that, ask yourself, is there this, what I call a holy discontent with this? Do I see the urgency? Do I see the need in our community? But in that difficult conversation, I want to throw a piece of good news at you real quick. And it's your last fill-in for the day. Because here's a great starting point we need to know. 47% of America's unchurched is willing to take a friend's offer to visit church. 47% of that group that we said was unclaimed is willing to take up your offer to come to church. And you say, well, come on, can't we just do some more mail-outs and, and, and can't we just do some more social media and all? And I'm like, yeah, we need to do those things. But, but you know what? The data's in on that too. It only has a 14% effect, effectiveness rate. Did you know that? And it costs much more. I get to pay way more. Come to find out you are still our best form of marketing. You are still the most powerful way to get the message out. And I hate to be a cheapskate. You're also my cheapest way to get it out. <laughs> I don't have to put a stamp on you. You are the message. You are still the most powerful, effective resource we have to invite people on a journey that Jesus Christ can make a difference in their lives. And so it's in your hands. I'm begging you to wrestle with that question. Do those facts and figures bother me so much? I'm ready to go tell some of the people around me about Jesus or just even invite them to church. And we provide you with resources. We've got these, these new invite cards. Take as many as you need. We'll print more. 
Take them. It's a simple invite to hand to a, a friend or a coworker or a neighbor and say, hey, you know what? I just want to invite you to church sometime. I'd love to take you. I'd love to meet you there. Whatever would make you comfortable. On the back, we've got the service times, both the Sunday and the Saturday service time on there with a reminder, everyone's welcome around here. It's come as you are. It's a great tool, and they're on the back table back there. Grab as many as you want. We've got a box underneath for you as well, too. Take these, hand them out wherever you go. You're our best form of advertising. Because the point is this, is we're called to go make a difference, not only in our city, but regionally and throughout the world. I put that quote up there at the beginning of the video. I just want to remind us again by a pastor named Bill Hybels of a, a, a church in the Chicago area. And he said the local church is the hope for the world. I believe that. And so I believe strongly that God is calling us to make a difference and put churches in those areas around town that desperately need to see the light of Jesus because of the darkness they are living in. And I think he's calling us to some of those suburban areas as well too because as we talked about Rich people have problems too, okay? And he's calling us to those rural communities all over the map to say it is time to bring a fresh wind of the gospel to see people baptized, to teach them and to make a difference in those communities. Instead of saying, hey, you come to us, we need to go to them, meet them where they are and make a difference there. It's a God-sized dream. I haven't got a clue what it looks like. But I spend every day on my knees praying to God, and I figured that's a good place to start. And I'm inviting you on that journey as well, too. A church on its knees crying out, saying, we're going to make a difference where we are, but in the areas beyond and throughout the world. Dear God, what does that look like? but it starts with this simple thing called inviting. Watch this video with me. Okay, here's a question. Do you believe you have a personal responsibility to share your faith? Surveys have shown that the overwhelming majority of you would answer yes. Okay, so what about this question? Have you shared your faith with anyone in the last six months? Surveys have shown that a majority of you would answer this question, no. I guess it's just not as easy as it seems, or at least as easy as we'd like it to be. Well, here's another question. How many times have you personally invited an unchurched person to church? Now this seems simple, right? And yet, surveys tell us that almost half of you would answer zero. I mean, there are lots of reasons why we don't, right? Like. Maybe it still feels a little awkward and uncomfortable. Or maybe we're just unsure how effective it is. Or we just expect to hear them say, well, no. Okay, so listen to this. When people are asked why they came to church in the first place, the vast majority of them say, I began attending because someone invited me. It wasn't the music or the pastor. It wasn't the childcare the youth program, or the building. Although these are all great things, important and valuable things, the main thing that got most of you up and through that door the first time wasn't any of these. It was an invitation. Another Sunday will be here soon, and it's the perfect time to show others what your faith is all about. And it can all start with one more simple question come to church on Sunday. Let's change the stats and watch as God changes hearts and lives. And let's start with something simple, an invitation.